Lord, we do count on your promise that says, as we gather in your name, you will be here. And we do ask that you open our hearts and our minds to you, to your presence, to your love, and to all that you are saying to us. For we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Form in us that which you desire. Work in us that which pleases you. We yield to your authority. And we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Services of baptism and confirmation and reception, all the things that we are doing this morning, in essence, are services of commitments. Those who are being presented are making very serious and very lifelong commitments. I said to those who are being confirmed, received and reaffirmed, all three categories, that it is a very courageous thing that you are doing to make a public and clear commitment to say in front of this family of people, and by virtue of them, Christians literally around the world, that you are making a public and clear commitment to serve Jesus Christ as your Lord, regardless of the price or the cost. So today's sermon in some ways is a way of fleshing out what does that commitment actually look like? What are we, in essence, signing up for? And for those of you who have already made those kinds of commitments, um, I don't know whether you will know what I, I'm about to say in terms of what you signed up for, but I wanted you to know that I didn't. When I was confirmed, I had almost no idea what I was getting myself into. But the service, the lectionary, the lessons, all of it are actually crystal clear. So what I want to do is briefly work through each of the lessons as it applies to this issue of commitment, to what are we saying yes when we are saying yes to Jesus? Starts in the Ezekiel reading. The prophet Ezekiel, God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel to a nation under judgment that have literally been scattered by war and by famine. And God offers an extraordinary gracious promise, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to gather you. I'm going to gather you into a place that will be beautiful and filled with all kinds of good things. In other words, the judgment that you are living under now of being scattered and subject to all of this wickedness is not the end. The end is, I'm taking you home. I'm bringing you back. And just when you think you're kind of basking in this, God's going to take care of me and he's going to bring me home. And no matter what I'm going through, it's going to be okay. Which is true, by the way. He says something that almost feels like, uh-oh, I didn't expect that. He said, but you know what's going to happen when I bring you all back? I'm actually going to judge between sheep and sheep. Really? Because what I see in this language that he's talking about sort of kicking each other aside and butting with their heads, and if you've ever seen sheep, they do do that to each other, is they say, you don't treat each other well when you're gathered together. And in fact, what happens, and I don't know about you, but I've certainly seen this in churches, where what happens is, is that when somebody comes into a church, they actually want to assume a position of responsibility and even authority and power, and they will use all kinds of very unchristian ways to try to get what they want. They'll gossip about somebody, they'll knock themselves aside, somebody aside, they'll put themselves in the limelight so they get noticed, and they expect to be thanked profusely for everything that they do. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, of course you have. It's all about it. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're without sin. We're in this one together, right? Nod your head. But Jesus, but the prophet is very clear that that kind of behavior invites judgment. That God's graciousness in bringing us back, which means removing the sting of our past and bringing us in a place where we enjoy the presence of God, is never an excuse for me to do whatever I want, even in a church. 
In fact, to be a part of the family of God is actually a commitment to servanthood. And that's what's going on in the Gospel reading. The wondrous thing about the passage, this kind of terrifying in some ways passage between the sheep and the goats, is the sheep have this incredibly unassuming sense of what they do. Lord, where did we see you? When? Hungry, thirsty, in prison, or, or sick, or lonely, or a stranger. We were just trying to take care of people. And Jesus says the most startling thing, if you've done it under the least of these in my family, you've You've actually done it to me. And it's the people that are called in this passage the goats, or as it is in the Ezekiel passage, the fat sheep. Filled with their own self-importance, would of course rise to the occasion if Jesus walked into the room. Because you see, it's all about standing next to the people of power. It's about affiliation. Uh, I, I want to be on his good side, you see. So certainly if Jesus walked into the room and needed anything at all, there would be plenty of people who would quickly rise to the occasion. Anything you need. But Jesus says, that's so predictable. And it's not what my servants should be looking like at all. No, what my servants look like, because they understand that to be committed to Christ is to make a commitment to servanthood, is that when you see the need, you jump in. Regardless of whether you get thanked or not, regardless of whether anybody else notices or not, you're just there to meet the need because, you see, that's actually what Jesus did for you. He was the one who broke into your lameness and your blindness, your loneliness and your brokenness, and he brought you back into a place of refreshment and peace. He's the one who brought forgiveness when no one else would, who even as we sang in the song earlier about removing sin and shame, that's only something that Jesus can do. It is His death and resurrection, His shed blood on the cross that touches places in our hearts and in our lives that no one else could come. That literally what Jesus does in a way that I find extraordinary is that He comes into the darkest places of our lives. The places we think nobody knows about at all. And literally washes our feet and brings healing and mercy and cleansing, removing the burden of condemnation, releasing us from the power of that shame, raising up us up to live with a level of dignity and authority and grace that gives us the freedom, the freedom to be available to serve other people because we're not so preoccupied by the shame and what others might think of me or not. You see, the crystal clear freedom that comes in serving Jesus is that we're just not so self-preoccupied anymore. It is the frightened and the insecure who want to always keep making themselves look good. Right? Not your head. <laughs> That's almost all of us, you see. And what Jesus is committed to doing is literally changing the focus of our attention. Not, so, not to be so self-preoccupied. Because you know you only have so much vision. You only have so much energy. And if where you're spending all of your energy and time is on you, and how you're coming across, and what you're saying to other people, and, and how you look, and wanting to make sure that you're impressive, and get your best foot forward, and to be light, you won't have the energy. You will not have the vision to see the needs that are in front of you. They won't even be there. Which is why the ghost said, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, in prison? <laughs> if I'd known that, I would have canceled anything in my appointment book to go see you if I knew you were in jail. But you see, that's still filled with that same kind of self-importance. That need to be in the spotlight, liked and appreciated. And Jesus is out to kill that. What he wants to do is so take you in and pour into you a new kind of knowledge of him, the riches of his grace, as it, as it says in the epistle lesson, that the focus of your attention shifts and it becomes, Lord, how can I serve you today? Show me today 
where I can be about your business. Help me to see people as you see them. Help me to see my circumstances as you see them. That I might be available. I don't want to be, Lord, one of those people who is so fearfully self-preoccupied, needing other people to build him up because I'm insecure, because I want people to like me. That that becomes the focus of my attention. You know, brothers and sisters, that's okay when you're about 10. It's unseemly when you're talking about that as an adult. But we have plenty of people inside the church who are 45-year-old, 10-year-olds. Because that place in their heart still does not know the good news of the gospel. They don't know the Ephesian passage. It's lavish that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I'm praying that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you might see the glorious riches of what you have inherited in Christ. It is a life-changing passage. And it is only where you make a stop in that passage and come back to it again and again and again that God actually begins to change your vision. And out of that, you are more than willing, because this is what God is doing, you are more than willing to take your place as that unassuming servant. Giving where it's very clear that the need should be met. And you step in. All of those who are marked as heroes, according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, are in their heart of hearts unassuming servants. They don't care whether they're up here or not. It's not a bad thing to be up here. But you know you're there by divine appointment. Maybe you're content to be in the pew and pray like crazy for people like me who are called to stand up and speak. I want you to know, and I've said this a hundred times, when I think rewards are given out in heaven, who's going to get the big ones are not the upfront people like me, but those who literally labored in intercessory prayer that somehow in the midst of our failing efforts to do something that might be helpful to people in honoring Jesus, God breaks through in power, not because of my eloquence or somebody else's good abilities, but because God chooses to answer the prayer of those unassuming servants who really don't care whether they're in the spotlight or not. Does that make sense to you? Nod your head if it does. Because you see, this is an entirely different way of looking at life than what you're taught on television, what you're taught in your music, what you're taught in just about everything that comes at you. Everything about our culture is, is about being self-important and doing the thing that makes you look good. Whether it's how you dress, whether it's who you're, with whom you're connected, whether it's how you pursue your education or your job, trying to make your way up the ladder, it's all about accomplishment and being well thought of. And therefore, to choose to say in the midst of that, I want to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to do the things that He wants of me. Is a radical reorientation to how you see life, not just the Christian faith, literally your whole life. So that you say, wherever God places you, whether they're positions of visible authority, or whether they're positions that are very quiet and unassuming, you're there to serve Jesus. You're there to be available for Him and for His purposes. Because let me tell you, whether you're talking about a fancy party, or whether you're talking about being on the street, there are always opportunities that God opens up for you to be a servant if you're looking for. But it takes that inner heart, that willingness to say, I want to be one of those people, God. I want to be one of those sheep that reaches out to the needs that I see. You see, God's vision is for the whole world. The collect that I prayed at the very beginning of the service says, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. That means every endeavor and area of life, civic, political, cultural, business, entrepreneurial, it all matters. None of it is strictly secular work. And God is looking for men and women who are willing to take their places in all of those arenas to say, I'm here to do your will, O oh God, show me what it is. So whether you're an artist, or whether you're a chef, or whether you're a lawyer, or whether you're a business person, whether you want a restaurant, whether you want a, 
a company that takes care of people's lawn maintenance. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you're in those places specifically to be available for Jesus to use you. In other words, there's no divide between my religious faith and then what happens on my job or what happens in my family. That's when you get into trouble, when you start living like that. You can be this person in the business world. Oh, but this person when you're in church. That's called schizophrenia. <laughs> it's not healthy. And confirmation, the commitments that you are making today says, I'm willing to bring it all together. I'm willing to not live with that kind of divide. I want to be one of those people who Jesus uses. When you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself is one of the commitments that I will ask of you today. And you will say, I will with God's help. Think about it. This is big stuff. It's a life commitment. But it is, family of God, it is the most wondrous thing to be a part of. To know the companionship of His presence, to have the joy of knowing that when you sit down with someone and you're there to serve them, that you're literally marking that person's life for all eternity, that you're doing things that absolutely matter, and that God has you in the arena where you are by a divine appointment, and He wants you to use, He wants to use you, and you're willing to say, I'm up for it. Lord, I'm ready. What do you want to do today? The eternal purpose that courses through your veins, the joy that you know. The enlightening of your heart that you experience. There's no comparison to it. It makes things like merely looking money, earning money, just seem like, yeah, okay. It's a small thing by comparison. So different from what the world says. So different from the world. So here's a family coming to present their little girl in baptism. What is she being baptized into? She's being baptized into this. What are these people who are coming here for confirmation and reception and reaffirmation committing themselves to? They're committing themselves to this. And if you've been baptized, if you've been confirmed or received, if you've made these steps into the life of Christ, that's what you said too, even though you may not know it. So today, my hunger and my hope, my longing for you is that as we walk through these promises together, something will happen inside of your heart. A new kind of yes will emerge. And out of that, <laughs> in this county, among these people, there will be rejoicing. Because unassuming servants are being unleashed into this community for the sake of the kingdom of God. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Okay, it's time for baptism. Do I want to come up here? Uh.